So good uh, morning again, and uh, thank you for coming back. We're going to start session two. Um, as I mentioned, session two is looking at COVID and governance issues across multiple countries in Asia Pacific region. Um, we have three excellent speakers for this one. Uh, we have Dr. Viroj Tanchran Satyan, who many of you know. Viroj is a senior advisor to the International Health Policy Program, as well as an advisor on global health to permanent secretary of Ministry of uh, Public Health in Thailand. He's uh, been doing this for decades as, 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 a, as, an, as a policy advisor, policy analyst, academic, uh, decision maker, decision advisor to Thailand, to the region, to many of the countries in the region. Um, uh, and he's won multiple awards for his uh, sincere and hard work on public health. Um, stop laughing, Neil. <laughs> and, uh, a, and he's a, a great mentor to many of us in the region. Um, as discussions, we have uh, Dr. Kathy and Reis. Um, Kathy actually used to be the Associate Dean for Research uh, at College of Public Health at UP Manila. She has recently set up her own NGO, the Alliance for Improving Health Outcomes in the Philippines. Uh, so she's uh, now working on that. Um, Kathy graduated from uh, Manila, uh, UP Manila, and uh, got a master's from Singapore. And uh, her interest is uh, her financing, governance, and regulation, and health policy system research. She's also a board member of the uh, uh, Health System Global, um, which are having their big meeting, I think, next month in Dubai. Um, uh, and, and she is also working uh, with the Alliance for Health Policy System Research in, in embedded research and identifying examples of embedded research in uh, Western Pacific region. And then we have uh, Professor Yodi Mahandarat Hatta. Uh, Yodi is the Vice Dean for Research and Development at the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing at Universitas Gajah Madia. Uh, in Indonesia. Uh, he got his master's in Germany and his PhD in Belgium in Ghent University. Um, he is also the leads the Southeast Asia Regional Training Center for Health Research on, on uh, through the WHO TDR program. Um, he's been involved in developing national strategies for implementation research and national strategies for TB for Indonesia uh, in conjunction with the Global Fund and his research interests are global health, implementation research, and disease control. Uh, Yodi has also won a number of uh, awards and was the visiting professor to Institute of Public Health in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, he, okay, I'm going to ask uh, Viroj if you want to start your presentation. Uh, and then we'll bring in Kathy and Yodi with the panel discussion, uh, bringing in specific views from uh, the countries, and then we'll open up to questions and answers. So please go ahead, sir. I'll mute myself now. Well, thank you, Nima. Um, thank you, um, the Department of Health um, and APO, which are convened meeting today. I will talk on behalf of five countries in Asia on how um, governance response to COVID-19 in 2021. First on EP situation, I introduce case and date on the upper panel, case per day and date per day. Uh, data from um, Worldometer. Uh, we see clearly uh, there are prolonged first and two and uh, second wave and quite a big wave on the third during the um, second and third quarter this year. And the association of number of dates, the maximum case per day is 
about 55,000 in Indonesia and maximum death is 2,000 or, or less. So, so Viruj, your slides yes. are moving down. Your slides are moving down. We're still on the uh, opening slide. Sorry, okay. can you? Um, yes, that's fine. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Indonesia. Okay. Can you see this one? Yes, we can Perhaps see the Indonesia slide. Okay. Yes. Slideshow. Now it's on. Huh? Let's put it on slideshow because it's now small. It's now small. It's full screen now. Oh, not slideshow. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Um, can you see this? Yes, we can see the Philippine slides. Um, um, okay. Case and death in the Philippines. Um, the maximum in the third wave is 20,000 per day. And death is quite um, sporadic throughout uh, 20 and 21. Singapore clearly they can control the first wave quite for quite some months. And then the outburst in the second wave in the last quarter of this year. Third and not, fourth uh, quarter. Viraj, your slides are moving forward. Do you want me to present on your behalf? Yeah, please. Can, can you do, do it my, uh, on, on, my, okay. on my behalf? Okay, give me one yeah. second. Give me one second, I'll do that. Uh, te technological glitch. Uh, okay. Is that okay? You can see the full. You can see the full slide now. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Next, go to Philippines. Go to Singapore. Still on first slide, Nima. Okay. Okay. Good. Singapore. Uh, next, Thailand has um, been able to control the first wave, which is very low. Um, in the first and the second quarter of 20, 2000, uh, 2020. And a big wave on the third, uh, second and third wave start um, from April this year. And a huge maximum case per day is around uh, August, September, about more than 20,000 a day. And the dead, the maximum is 300 uh, per day. Next. Vietnam can control very well until um, the third and fourth quarter of this year. Uh, there's a big upsurge above uh, 1,005 in September this year. And quite well controlled uh, this few, day, few, uh, few weeks. And also the associate uh, that in the same wave has been reported. So in conclusion, of five countries, there are big wave in the last and uh, the third and fourth quarter of this year. Next slide, please. This is a cumulative confirmed case per million so that we can compare. Because Singapore has smaller population size, then um, the case per million has gone up more than um, about um, less than 30,000 per million population, followed by Thailand, Philippines, and Vietnam is much lower, about 10,000 per million population were affected. Next slide, please. This is total confirmed dead per million. In Indonesia has gone up to 5,000 dead per million population whereby Singapore debt is very low. That means they can manage. 
uh, see the case quite very well early in, in the clinical uh, trajectory. After Indonesia, followed by Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam. In this slide, next slide, please. Um, is the daily confirmed case per day. So that will reflect um, the case load and it can overwhelm the health system. Notably um, during uh, July, August, September, October in Indonesia, there was about uh, more than 50,000 cases per day maximum. So that can overwhelm the health system and not overwhelming the health system, it, it prevent um, services to uh, non-COVID essential services, such as life-threatening myocardial infarction. Uh, that followed by the Philippines and Thailand. So these five countries are heavily affected by COVID in the last two quarters of this year. Next slide, please. I will talk about governance in this second part. It is defined as how a country managed to formulate, to implement, and to oversee sound policy by mobilizing and coordinating multiple actors through the whole of government to achieve common goal. In this case, is to minimize case and minimize debt and publish literature. So far, it confirmed that country with better governance, adequate, adequate financing, effective cost sectoral actions, and complete engagement are, most, are more resilient during the COVID and better recover in the recovering phase between both. Actually, we know any single country is in the full recovery phase because of the uh, Delta, Delta Plus, because it is much, much higher infectivity. Next, please. This is an ongoing study. Uh, we plan to publish in BMJ Global Health. And it was paused because all country authors are extremely busy in responding to COVID in the recent wave. Therefore, it was paused about two and a half months. We have to resume and quickly conclude this paper soon. Um, we can synthesize this are the key message. The key governance attribute in effective managing pandemic include leadership, whole government and whole of society approach, citizen trust in government institution, in public health institution um, in particular, is a key societal context. It also supports the vaccine rollout and can debut the vaccine hesitancy. Timely decision, which is guided by evidence and mostly not full proper evidence, you see that in this last year and this year, even, and even uh, not fully uh, uh, reviewed paper are uh, posted on the website because it support at least some evidence available. We found that agile and adaptive to augment physical, financial, and human resources in line with the pandemic, pandemic and size and viral, viral strain, uh, um, where they're not concerned, is so important. One has to strike between uh, the agile and adaptive with proactive and anticipatory strategy, such as we all see and clear natural policy direction and guideline, plus local implementation adaptation. So we have to allow for flexibility in the in life local context. And effective risk communication and ensure complete engagement is so important to increase adherence in the population to public health and social measures. Next, please. Um, from the country, Five countries, all countries are affected to, to some extent by SARS, by H5N1, by mers cov and more or less they are well prepared. But the unprecedented size of COVID in these five countries, they have to adapt a lot. And this uh, paper is about that. 
we found that centralized perform better to the dynamic and rapid evolving dynamic pandemic than the decentralized government structure, in particular the devolved system in Philippines and in Indonesia. From Indonesia, it was reported that weak and unwill, uneven resources and capacity among some local government hamper effective response, and also multi layer of communication hamper timely response and timely support from natural government to the local government. There's a hard political choice between health of the population and restoring the economy. Many countries want to open up international travel and they face another wave, another outbreak, like it is in the UK, for example. Next, Chris. Then we have a primary data collection across five countries on the governance structure and function, and these are the common pattern. Next, please. First, uh, the highest level multi-ministry committee led by the head of state or deputy minister, deputy prime minister or minister. This are uh, common across five countries. There is a multi-sector response with legal power plus technical expertise mobilized for specific tasks, for example, for vaccine rollout for risk communication. All countries except Indonesia have centralized governance system. It shows cohesive and effective response. But Indonesia devolved context create complexity and multi layer of coordination between national and provincial district government. It can hamper effective, immediate, and timely multi sector collaboration. And Yodi, you can uh, expand a little bit further. I don't know why um, actually uh, in Philippines, it is also a fully devolved uh, system. Then um, a colleague from, uh, in the, uh, from Philippines can clarify this. Next uh, slide, please. Inadequate resource in pub and public health capacity in some local government and inadequate and untimely support from national government. Um, this is a report from uh, Indonesia. We found that those centralized systems in Thailand and Vietnam power were delegated to the provincial administration, but not in Singapore because Singapore is a city state. It's, it's very small, therefore it is a, everything is centralized and central command and managed. Next, please. This is the final section, which is the governance capacity in mobilizing essential resources for effective response. And essential resources uh, start from infrastructure, human resource, and fund funding, financial resources. Next, please. We have a matrix of five countries here. Uh, physical resource in five countries, we focus on PPE, we focus on uh, RT-PCR lab test, which is the key entry point for case identification. On the last row, it demonstrates number of tests per million population as of not June, it's as of uh, today. Uh, I have update um, figure here. Singapore has tested 3.5 million tests per million population. So that means one population were tested 3.5 times. And followed by Vietnam has scaled up up to uh, 431 tested per million. So at least 43% of the population, per million, sorry, uh, has been tested. Um, less so for Indonesia, 165, less so for, for Thailand. So that can underestimate number of cases and number of data dates for which uh, we need to monitor the excess debt and leave, uh, review the civil registration and vital statistics on excess debt from COVID condition and from non-COVID condition. Next slide, please. 
Next slide is on financial resource and how the government mobilized more or less, they can mobilize quite well. Quite well, I would say, through uh, all these five countries has USC. For example, Philippines cover all case of treatment for OPNIP with an additional budget of 301 million US dollar being mobilized. Singapore also IP costs covered by the government and private insurance. All country emerge a common trend that there's additional, significant additional government investment apart from the USC system in these five countries. Next slide, please. On human resource, um, Singapore is outstanding in terms of uh, doctor, nurse, and midwife per 10,000. It has gone up to about 94 doctor, nurse, and midwife per 10,000, and less so for Indonesia. Um, more, case, uh, more doctor, nurse than stay in Philippines, 60. And the SDG benchmark uh, by 2030 is uh, 44. 0.4 per 10,000 population. Um, Philip, uh, Vietnam and Thailand are on par, 27 and 22. I would say that um, all corner of the health workforce were mobilized to support um, COVID response. And that may lost sight on other essential services. Uh, Yode and team is leading to look at impact on um, essential services as a result of first overwhelming health system and second, um, because of the restriction of travel that patient cannot travel to seek care and how government uh, respond by using uh, telemedicine, teleconsultation and uh, this patch of medicine through post. Next slide, please. So discussion point by panelists, we have uh, Philippines and Indonesia on the floor. I'd like to provoke discussion apart from further clarification in the slides from your country perspective and field experience. What governance structure and government attribute are the weakest link and how should we rectify? And what resources are the most deficient and how should we and what should we rectify? Uh, Nima, can you go back to the um, governance attribute? Before this, I think. Yes, this one. Over to you, Nima. Thank you, Viroj. Um, I'm going to keep the slide up if that's okay, so that we can talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask if it's possible for Yodi. Would you like to come and bring in your uh, views and, and, and your findings in, in, in with regards to Indonesia? And then I'll ask the same from Kathy. In the meanwhile, please, if you have any questions, type it in in Q&A section. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you, Nima, and thank you, Viraj, for that presentation, for the very nice overview. So coming back to, there were two questions, right, uh, Viraj, uh, what government's attribute are the weakest link? Uh, that's going to be the first one that I will try to respond, and after that, what resources are the most efficient? Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, the weakest link, I'm going to come back. Uh, you highlighted a lot, uh, Firaj, uh, regarding the decentralized setting in Indonesia, uh, which uh, have a lot of issues around it, uh, which is uh, completely true. So what, what we are seeing is that within this decentralized setting, there is a lot of ongoing power plays between the center and the regional government. And uh, on top of that, there are also some political rivalry between the central government and certain regional governments. So that makes things quite difficult. Eh? And that leads to the disjointed national response to the coronavirus and also the local government's inability to mount large-scale interventions 
Now, what we see here, there, there is actually an intermediary, which is the governor. So we have a president, governor, and then the mayor or the district. Uh, most of the power is at the district level in, in this regard. But what we see now is that uh, throughout this pandemic, some governors have actually emerged as effective intermediaries, while actually the role by law is actually more of a coordinator. So I think uh, moving forward, uh, we should have a look again at our current decentralization law, uh, re-evaluate it again, because uh, moving forward, uh, the authority at the uh, provincial level, at the government level, may need to be strengthened to streamline governance across the archipelago, because uh, during this pandemic, we see some of these governors uh, were really good in synchronizing district responses and also sometimes even forcing the hand of the central government when, when necessary. So they, they really have a strong role to play there. Because otherwise, as, as you said, uh, there is so much variations across the district and uh, it becomes very difficult to have a unified uh, response to COVID-19. So that, that's one, one thing that's about the decentralization setting. Now, another issue in terms of the governance uh, attribute is also what perhaps hasn't come out uh, really uh, from the overview uh, presentation was that uh, for this pandemic response, the, the legal basis uh, has not been actually followed consistently. So we have a health quarantine law, uh, law number six, 2018, uh, which actually stipulates uh, isolation, home quarantine, hospital quarantine, regional quarantine, large social restrictions. And these terms are precisely defined, but they are not used consistently by our government. Instead, they are creating a lot of new terms, a lot of new abbreviations, uh, which are very difficult, uh, which are not clearly defined and they keep changing. And it's very difficult to be understood uh, by the public. And it's also very difficult to, to uh, coordinate among the sectors and among uh, the levels of the government because they are creating new things which actually are not defined in existing law, in the health quarantine law. So that's also another thing which, which I think uh, needs to be rectified uh, to bring back more consistent to an existing legal basis so that it's more easier to implement and it's clearer also to communicate because otherwise they keep uh, coming up with new acronyms, uh, new concepts, which are you don't find a strong legal basis beside discretion of the president. And the third, in terms of the governments, is about the leadership uh, that you mentioned there as a key point. Now, the, the issue here is that uh, I think and the government uh, has not been consistent in terms of assigning and appointing the, the officials who are in charge. Now, from the start, uh, curiously, uh, the government have not really given uh, the command to the health minister to actually lead this. And uh, actually, uh, the current uh, chief uh, in charge of the uh, multi high level uh, multi ministry committee is the Ministry of Coordinating of Economy and which have not, nothing whatsoever uh, influence in terms of health sector. And before that, it was the coding maritime affairs also has no direct connection to any health issues. So that's, that's quite uh, curious. And also that has a lot of effect because he has, they have no direct authorities uh, to the health sectors or any relevant ministries directly related to public health. And uh, for that reason, it's also indicating that the government at the moment of the president uh, does not regard the pandemic as a primary health issue, but more of an economic issue. And, and that, uh, that caused a problem because now uh, in that sense, then uh, public health is more or less uh, subjugated to, to economy. So it's, uh, you mentioned that there is a tricky balance, tricky hard choice between economy and health. But as far as the uh, Indonesian people can see, uh, the one on the driver's seat is the economy, uh, while the one on the back seat is the health uh, sector. So that, that's, that's uh, a bit uh, difficult. So I think uh, if, if in terms of rectified, we have to, to fix this governance of the COVID-19 response. So it's more in line with the law and the principles of good governance in public administrations. And that begins with treating this pandemic as a, it's a multiple issue, but it's a public health issue at its core. So it, that would should, uh, shift the interest and the priorities of the COVID-19 response, uh, which we have at the moment, which is more heavy on the economic uh, considerations. So that's, that's for the first one. Uh, do you want me to directly go to the resource or do, we, or do I stop there? No, you can continue and then I'll bring Kathleen after. That's okay. Okay. 
Okay, so basically, it's it's more of uh, putting back uh, the leadership uh, to the institutions, to the ministries who have the appropriate authority and portfolio. That that's I think the number one. And then in terms of resources, as uh, Viraj have already highlighted in the overview, so we we have a lot of problems with resources. I mean, the available medical staffs are insufficient. Also, our logistic medical supply chain is also fragile and it's also insufficient. And our health infrastructure is also still ad inadequate. I mean, we uh, in June and July, uh, most of our hospitals were practically collapsing. A lot of the patients were not even in the building. They were outside in, in the parking areas because they, they cannot be uh, admitted to, to the building inside the, the hospital. So uh, that's going to be a long uh, discussion, but um, I think I'll just pick up on, on the human resource because I think that's uh, the most uh, important one. And Firaj highlighted also in terms of ratio, we are actually very low compared to the other countries. And that uh, just speaks to that this pandemic basically highlight the human resource challenges that our country has been struggling with. We have inadequate physician to population ratio. We have inequality of physician geographical distribution, and we have significant shortage of nurse and midwife. And this, as the slide has also shown, is aggravated by the number of deaths of healthcare professional in Indonesia, because we have a quite high number of healthcare professional who are infected and also dying because of this COVID-19. Now, on top of that, uh, also because uh, during the, the surge, during the peak of the COVID-19 cases, uh, the workload of the healthcare workers has also been very overwhelming. And that leads to long and irregular hours of continuous work. And consequently, that triggers psychological distress. And I mean, we've had some studies which shows that these healthcare workers with direct contact are responsible to COVID-19, uh, they are experiencing a higher risk of depressive symptoms and burnouts. So I think that's, that's a core issue. And so the government actually need to consider some human resource strategies uh, to be able to cope uh, with uh, surges uh, in terms of cases so they can think of uh, advancing mechanism for task shifting. So, I mean, uh, for example, senior resident can be given the authority to perform tasks of specialists like pulmonologists. We can also think of fast tracking clinical training through accelerated programs so that personnel can enter services after a shorter intensive training period. And also recruiting more volunteers. We have been recruiting volunteers, but also in terms of redistributing within the region. At the moment, it's uh, very much uh, districts, provinces, uh, recruiting their own, but there is very little redistribution across the region and the provinces uh, to improve, to optimize the allocation of existing personnel. And on top of that, we need to consider again, the protection of the health worker in terms of uh, providing sufficient uh, protection equipment, protective gears, and also in terms of giving psychological support uh, to these uh, healthcare professionals. I think that's all, Nima, for my. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I see that we've got one question, but before we go to, can I ask Kathy? Kathy, do you have any insights or, or, or comments that you want to bring in with regards to the Philippine situation? Um, and then we go to Q&A to everybody. All right, thank you. So I, uh, um, of course, um, everyone, um, I know my, my Philippine colleagues would know that we are a decentralized um, system. And therefore, we do echo a lot of um, um, the experience in, in Indonesia. But I think what I would like to highlight uh, from, from my end, apart from what has been reported or, or shown earlier by, excellently by uh, Dr. Viraj, uh, would be the time perspective. So when, we, uh, when I would look at the challenge in governance, um, I think that the impact of a certain weakness depends on you know what phase are you in in in, in the fight uh, because in in the end it's really being fast enough to decide and uh, fast enough to act so that the virus will not beat you so definitely during the earlier part of the response um, philippines do have a preparedness plan so there is already a governance set but that uh, policy was not very clear in terms of working um, at the subnational level down to the local government unit. And therefore, uh, when the pandemic actually moved much faster than we were prepared, um, 
we definitely struggled on how to manage that decentralized uh, governance. And also given that there were a number of structures that were created, governance structures that were created, so it took time to bridge the policy uh, policy design uh, aspect of it to operationalization. So that really impacted on how uh, we could respond to the um, ongoing pandemic. And coupled with that, um, when, when you are working in a very uncertain environment and evolving uh, nature and with a population of, you know, uh, almost one, um, uh, uh, 11, uh, 111 million Filipinos, communication is very important. So therefore, any decision wherein collective action, communities will have to move. Um, we also had uh, initial struggles around that because, um, you know, a lot of moving pieces, the private sector is moving to respond, and then some people don't know what's happening. Um, uh, you know, even some, some people in other sectors are panicking, like, what are we going to do? So the, managing the communication flow initially became a challenge until certain uh, a routine in, in, you know, putting out bulletins, putting the numbers out there became established. And even the media became familiar on how the reporting will happen. And even, you know, uh, most Filipinos would know when to tune in, where to look at if they are interested in following um, what the government is interested to do and as we and of course couple with that no the, the governance structure how the decisions are communicated the resources have to be in place so definitely we also struggled with that because even pre-pandemic we were already struggling with you know the resources on how to um, finance universal health care and Philippines was in the process of like figuring out from where the money will be coming from. And then you suddenly have this pandemic. So um, that really challenged, you know, it, it really stretched our capacity to respond quickly as we would have wanted to do. Now, as we move um, towards the latter part of the pandemic, it became very evident that data no, information became crucial because now that in a way you have stabilized the way that communication is happening, but now you need more information, especially that the situation is evolving. Uh, we have all these variants coming out and, and also once the vaccine started to come in, we need, you know, to improve our surveillance system so that the government can, you know, adjust its response. And there has been some discussions around data, um, where are we getting the contact tracing numbers, so on and so forth. So that became really a challenge. I think it's still an ongoing challenge. So I think for uh, moving forward now, where we are now in, in the country, um, of course, resources is still crucial. No? We need to um, really be more... I think have a lot of discussions around resources, given that we do have commitments to universal health care. We cannot forget that. We need to restore services and we still need to respond to this pandemic. And I think um, very crucial to that decision making will be information. So this is at the space where Philippines is now at information will really play a lot of role because it will help the decision makers prioritize where to where to move and how to move in 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 the response especially now that the the country will will is slowly opening up so definitely we are anticipating new challenges you know, in in our response um, in terms of the um, funding the resources aspect of it um, we also, I, I would also look at it as uh, really a challenge in phases. So initially, uh, in, in the pandemic response, we really struggled in um, testing and, and that uh, ha impacted uh, so much our response capacity. But as uh, the country quickly ramped up, you know, um, in its capacity, now we are able to catch up, but still we need more. Uh, we need to be able to test more. We need to be able to, to really look where the cases are so that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the response now is get, getting more granular. So definitely we need more resources down to the 
provinces and if possible for some area down to the district level so that the the information can be can, can guide decision maker uh, decision making um, even better um, and and right now we need more information for instance in surveillance so that the vaccine strat vaccination strategies can can um, respond properly so when when now that we are the country is moving towards uh, more opening up uh, we also need to 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 be more consistent with our communication uh, the communication aspect uh, because definitely behaviors are going to change so uh, government must be able to communicate how how uh, the opening up is um, affecting the the overall country uh, situation and how we should respond um, in, in according to you know uh, the type of risk that you have in in the community so I, I think for for the Philippines it really depends on the faces and we're hoping that as we open up the the economy um, in the coming months we will um, be better in in this area that will allow us to um, decide accordingly according to the risk and according to uh, the level of uh, of cases that you know that is coming up because of the changes in behavior and changes in uh, in in societal interaction in the coming months thank you thank you uh, sorry let me just mute my other uh, okay uh, thank you very much i, I have one question which is actually a specific i think for indonesia which is about uh having does indonesia have problems on international migration of health personnel during the pandemic and i guess the same thing will apply to the philippines as well um so yodi do you know if there was any problems with that um and also kathy yeah okay Nima. so uh we never had much of issue yet in terms of international migration. I mean, I, I think it's very different from the Philippines. We do not export uh, healthcare professional a lot, even during the, even before the pandemic even. We export a lot of patients. So we, a lot of Indonesian go abroad uh, to get treatment, but not a lot of doctors, nurses, or midwives go abroad uh, from Indonesia. So our problem is more of internal or domestic migration rather than inter external or international migration. So it's more of internal migration in terms of distributions that uh, the doctors are more concentrated in the urban areas and so forth, but not so much in terms of international migration. That's all, Nima. Um, for Thank the you. Philippines, uh, uh, right, so for the Philippines, as uh, Yodi mentioned, no, um, we are exporting. Um, so definitely that became a, an issue, um, especially during the surge, because uh, there were policies that, uh, you know, prevented um, those who were already scheduled to like go out, um, they, they were prevented from going out for mainly for the reason of, you know, uh, making them stay here in the country. And also um, there were occasions when um, it would have made sense to like move personnel from one area to another where they are more needed. But um, I think there were some tensions around that uh, because uh, admittedly, some of the staff that can be mobilized are, are you know, in, in public facilities. So that created some um, tension. And for some, it's like ethical question. Why, why are we being mobilized when we are, you know, in, in, uh, in an underserved area? But uh, at some point, um, most of the issues i think were resolved uh, there were uh, discussions uh the, the the government spoke to stakeholders uh you know uh, groups and they were able to also mobilize volunteers whenever needed um, inter, um internally you know with, within the within the country and also uh, lately the issue around international uh, you know migration international movement um, i think this has also been uh, resolved so Kathy, uh, let me just follow up with that because, um, and then open it up to everybody else on the second bit. Um, um, the, the, the HRH people who weren't allowed to move because of basically what you're telling me is the closure of the borders. Were they then absorbed and used within the health sector in the Philippines or were they just sitting around doing nothing, waiting for the borders to open? Did you lose that capacity? 
that, that, that resource. And the next part, which is to everyone, um, you've alluded to this already, is the role of moving the staff to, the, to their required areas and how successful were you are three countries in, 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 in either voluntarily or by force moving staff from uh, to areas where there was a more higher demand, higher requirement for them um, as part of the pandemic response. So over to you, Kathy. Um, uh, yeah, for, for the first part, you know, the, the international, um, those who were previously working internationally, um, they, they, the restrictions was again, uh, dependent on the or, or was due to the you know the, the surge that that was experienced here in the country and also for some it's mostly because of border uh, restrictions like they cannot go out um there were uh i remember that during that that part now where we really needed a lot of human resources there were a lot of hiring you know, so um opening of positions so that those who wish to serve um during the the height of the pandemic they, they they had opportunities to to do so and to to really help here locally so we know some of the posts uh, were open i'm sorry i just don't have the numbers now so these were and probably my doh colleagues would, would know more about this so uh the posts actually were um a number of these posts were filled especially during the you know the most the, the highest part of our our um surge and um and then eventually, you know, they when they when they were allowed to leave, and then you know, some some them of them went back went back to work uh, abroad. Now on the internal migration or in the internal movement of staff, uh, these were volunteer uh, voluntary, you know. So the mechanism is voluntary, and um, the government would uh, raise the call and um, also oriented those who would wish to to go, and then also lined up. Um, some benefits or um, incentives for them to move from one location to the other. And uh, this was facilitated mainly by, by government. Okay, thank you. Viroj, any comments? Um, we have by the electional movement, um, there were falls in particular nurses and not um, ICU expert. They volunteer to mo to mobilize to be mobilized to support the most severe affected provinces. And also, on the other way around, we move patient from the Overland province in Bangkok, move outside, move to the province, and inform the province to set up. When you are ready, your field hospital will have a yellow, uh, medium, uh, severe. Prepare your field hospital with oxygen supply, etc. And prepare your ICU for we have a few number of severe. Then we have a special van with a fully pro protected um, gear, um, special design and adapt a bus, a coach, and transfer 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, out, 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 out. So we have by directional uh, transfer patient and health workforce because uh, intensive care expert is so difficult to move them. We have to um, uh, let them stay in their station and move patient. But the less um, um, another cardio personnel that we can move easily. Thank you. Um, Yodi, and uh, as part of this thing, I also have an additional question which was came in. Uh, how do you motivate to stay your staff um, um, as part of the, the, the answer to this question? Thanks. Okay, so first of all, I think it's quite similar to what uh, Viraj and Kathy was also uh, describing for Thailand and Philippines. So in terms of moving around, it's more voluntary. So the government does uh, recruit volunteers so that they can move them around. It's much more difficult to redistribute uh, specialists who are already uh, already working in certain hospitals. And, and also because of the decentralization issue, each of the head of the district also would like to keep their specialists uh, within their district hospital and don't want to lose them 
them because they don't know whether they will get also a surge of cases in the coming weeks or months. So they, they like to keep them there. So that's that's very difficult. So what's happening is uh, similar to what Viraj was also saying that uh, in that case, then the patients start moving. So sometimes the hospitals in, in the epicenters, in the hot zones, then they, they send the patients to other areas where uh, it's not yet overwhelmed, where the physicians are still there. And so our hospital, for example, we receive referrals from hospitals from districts which are six hours drive away because we had less cases. So it was the patient moving that way. That's much easier than moving the specialists, moving the physicians, uh, except for, for the volunteers who, who actually volunteer to, to move around. Uh, in terms of the in um, how to motivate, I think that was referring to the external migration and why the Indonesians are not moving internationally. And uh, I don't think there is much effort in terms of motivating to stay. It's just that it's not part of the culture of Indonesian to go abroad overseas, unlike uh, Chinese, Indian, Philippines, perhaps a lot of people move abroad, but Indonesians you don't see a lot overseas. And uh, again, it's more of internal migration and that, that we still have issues in terms of motivating so that the, 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 the specialist, the physician doesn't go to the private uh, hospitals and the urban centers. That, that's the, the issue of motivating. But there is not much of an issue of keeping them in the country, at least for, for now. And that's still uh, part of the culture that people are more or less comfortable here, regardless of the situation. That's all, Lima. Thank you. We're coming to the end. I don't see any more Q's and A's. So let me take my prerogative and ask one question. Um, Viraj, as part of your presentation, you were talking about you know, uh, evidence and introduction of evidence in the highest level of decision making. Uh, um, and we are talking about lead agencies in each of these countries, which are very different. In Indonesia, it's not the health, which is the lead agency, it's the economy and commerce, etc. while in other countries, it is the health or sits on the prime ministers and the cabinet level. How do you gauge the success or the presence of having a formal technical expert committee which can actually feed the evidence. I'm talking about you know, equivalent to the, in the UK, there's the SAGE, which provided direct technical advice to the ministries and to Ministry of Edge. Has that been a good experience in your countries? Was it successful? Was it there on paper, but nobody listened to them? Nobody took up their advice? What's your experience? Um, and feel free, uh, Viraj, do you want to start? We have uh, 20 months experience work closely and part and parcel of the EOC, the Emergency Operating Center on a daily basis. Even today, our two of our young fellow are attending the EOC. And we contribute, if there is any quick question, really will immediately. For example, uh, how to open school, how to open the economy, then we have a Zoom with Public Health England uh, through our network and talk, what is your experience? Um, when there's a doubt whether Favit Pilawir is useful or not, we quickly synthesize the best available published, uh, unaudited published paper and see there are five, 10, do we use um, colloquin? So quick synthesis um, is very important. And also IGP establish um, social listening since April, um, since April last year. So we maintain almost 20 months um, on a weekly, by uh, uh, two weekly basis to monitor population adherent to mass, to social distancing, to travel, and we monitor Google, and all these are fed into the EOC decision. Uh, we uh, conduct social listening, infodemic uh, management, look at the uh, adherence and uh, willingness to be vaccinated among the people. And we conduct one key study on trust of the people on the institution in the public and private in health institution, etc. So all these are, I would say, the intelligence part of the EOC. And that um, research institution like IGP and HITAP 
and others university uh, also contribute a lot to framing evidence informed policy okay you've told me about generation of the evidence let me push you on this are they listening taking it and actually acting on that uh, really seriously uh, very seriously both uh, the EOC and the MOH and the CCSA chaired by Prime Minister who look at the summary and recommendation from the EOC. So the entry point is the MOH Emergency Operating Center that um, solicit apart from EPI daily briefing on the epidemiological situation, how many import cases, how many dead, and what is the viral circulation, alpha strain, beta strain, etc. Thank you. Yodi, any comments? Yeah, uh, I think in our case, uh, in terms of translating from evidence to policy, we are not yet as institutionalized as Aviro just described for, for Thailand. So many of the mechanisms are still very much uh, ad hoc. So, for example, uh, I often get a last minute call and, uh, okay, the ministries have a meeting and they require all of the researchers to come and give uh, inputs and so forth, but that's very ad hoc. So it's not as systematic as what uh, Viroj has been uh, describing. And uh, in, in that sense, also, it's, it's very difficult because, it, because it's not structured, it's not institutionalized, and what you get is a forum where you get conflicting advices. So it's, if you don't have a coherency in terms of the advice, also because the evidence keep moving and if it's not synthesized, and it's very difficult. Um, and also what, what I found is that um, many of us were not so much ready to, to do that because many of the questions that they had are more uh, transdisciplinary. I mean, so for example, when they asked me whether we should lock down the capital or not, I mean, I could only just say from epidemiological perspective, but then they ask, okay, what is the economic and political impact? I don't know, I cannot answer that. I mean, that requires other colleagues, other disciplines. So that's 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 not there yet. We don't have that transdisciplinary interdisciplinary uh, policy uh, thing, thing uh, which can fit in a comprehensive advice uh, to the government, even in an ad hoc basis. So we, we're not, there yet. And one of the lessons is that now the minister wants to actually develop this national health agency uh, center so that they are more institutionalized in terms of uh, translating from knowledge to policy, perhaps similar to what uh, Viraj was describing for Thailand. That's all, Nima. Thank you very much, Shuni. Fascinating. Kathy, do you want to have your final say? And then we can close the session. I noticed that we are running outside of time. So please go ahead. Right. So um, apart from, from that, no one of the, like in the Philippines, we did have a lot of experts and, and a lot of them are still working now. But um, I think it really matters uh, which ones are institutionalized, which ones are, are, you know, just formulated because of the pandemic. Because for those who are in, in, institutionalized, it's clearer how the decision making uh, comes out and what exactly is the meaning of that decision. But for those that were, you know, organized ad hoc uh, during the pandemic, it was a little more difficult how to deal with like their recommendation. So there were all efforts along the way to define what does this, this what does this recommendation mean compared to you know the other bodies that were formulated precisely to help government in on the technical aspect of it. And and also um, as you said, I think what we need to do here is really reflect on um, how can we make this more manageable because um, Definitely the voices of many experts is important, but it can also confuse if we are not clear what each of the voice would mean and what, ex what weight does that voice carry in terms of the decision making, um, you know, influencing the decision making process. And I think that is something that we also need to clarify learning from, you know, what happened uh, what, and what is still happening in this pandemic. I think that's the case in any kind of political advice is that, you know, who's, <laughs> whose advice are you going to listen to? Um, uh, and how will it fit into your own political viewpoint, I guess, more than anything else. Listen, thank you very much to all of you uh, for this fascinating talk. And thank you to all of our attendees and participants. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I would like to close this session. Um, and I would like to ask everybody to join back again in approximately an hour and five minutes or so uh, for the next session. The third session, the afternoon session, is uh, starting with uh, the, the shifts in public health and social measures from pandemic to endemic uh, when it comes to COVID. So the conversation is about how do we going to live with the COVID, basically.
Um, I, and, and this is being, uh, the presentation is being led by Dr. Elena Levido Quigley from NUS in Singapore. And we have Kathy and Dr. Ontramai uh, from Vietnam joining us. And then the final session is about using of routine data for policy and decision making. Um, in decentralized countries, so we're looking at primarily between uh, Indonesia and the Philippines and how they have managed to use that data. You see that we've tried very hard to bring in Philippines to all of these presentations because that's the primary audience. So it makes sense to do that. Um, so that's the second session in the afternoon and that's being led by uh, Dr. Karen Grappin from uh, Hong Kong University with colleagues from uh, UP Manila uh, Dr. Uh, Raymond Sarmiento and also colleagues from Gajah Mada University, uh, not EOD, but EOD's colleagues, uh, Tiara and Dr. Lotfa. Um, so with that, thank you very much again, and we shall see you in about an hour's time, those who are here. Thank you very much. I'll keep the link to the meeting going, so feel free to log in, log out, but this will be going at the moment from here. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Nima. Bye, Firaj. Bye, Kathy. Bye. Bye. Bye, Kathy.